Good afternoon. My name is Mona Frederick, and I am the executive director of the Robert Penn Morin Center for the Humanities here at Vanderbilt. I am delighted to introduce Dr. George C. Hill, Vanderbilt University's first ever Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Dr. Hill is Levi Watkins, Jr., MD, Professor Emeritus in Medical Education, and Distinguished Professor Emeritus in the Department of Pathology, Microbiology, and Immunology. He also served as Assistant Vice Chancellor for Multicultural Affairs and Special Assistant to the Provost for Health Affairs from 2011 to 2012. In announcing the appointment of Vice Chancellor Hill, Chancellor Nicholas Zeppo stated, George Hill is a giant in two fields molecular biology, and fostering diversity. He has a deep understanding both of the opportunities that we have as a top research university and the challenges we must overcome until every single member of our community is fully and equally included. We are grateful to Dr. Hill for giving us some welcoming remarks today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm a Baptist, and when, when, a, when the pastor says something, we all uh, respond in a, an affirmative way. So I'm going to try this again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it really is a pleasure to welcome you, and it's also a pleasure to welcome my pastor, uh, Reverend Kelly Miller Smith, Jr. And his uh, mother is here. Could you stand, please? Thank you so much. <laughs> Mrs. Risby is one of the star marks of our church. And uh, we all love you so very, very much. Even though you did have him as a son. <laughs> our, church is a, is a, is a, our church is First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill. It's a very loving church. Uh, and we love the pastor, and we love his father, and the other pastors that we've had. But we also are um, a friendly church. I, I, would, I would say we're a very friendly church. And so we welcome everyone, and we, we always have something to smile about and, and to enjoy each other about. So I always enjoy, and we all enjoy his ser sermons and his messages to us. But we also enjoy life, so we, we, we I think it would be proper to say we laugh a lot in our church, wouldn't you say? We have a, a great sense of humor, and the pastor has a great sense of humor. Um, on behalf of our chancellor, uh, Nicholas Zeppos, and our provost, Susan Wente, who's the, also the vice chancellor for academic affairs, and our entire management team and our faculty and students, it is certainly my pleasure to welcome you to Vanderbilt, those of you who have come from outside the institution. Of course, all of us in our Vanderbilt family welcome uh, today. It, it certainly is going to be, I think, a fascinating panel, uh, recovering lost voices. And I think all of us will gain a tremendous amount from the messages that we hear. In the recent introduction of the book, Who Speaks for the Negro by Robert, War Robert Penn Warren, there's a quotation that I think is, is most appropriate. And it says the following, from Robert Penn Warren and his essay, Brothers to Dragon in 1953. The words are, knowing is maybe a kind of being and if you know, can really know, a thing in all its fullness, then you are different. And if you are different, then everything is different somehow too. And that's kind of why we're here today. This afternoon is, is an opportunity to learn 
to expand our knowledge to know, and to identify with and gain from the work of Warren Penn Warren and those with whom he spoke. I would like to really point out another set of words that Mr. Warren wrote when he said, it's actually the first words in the book. I have written this book because I wanted to find out something firsthand about the people, some of them anyway, who are making the Negro Revolution what it is, one of the dramatic events of the American story. So what an opportunity we have today to continue to experience this continued revolution. I thank you for your presence, your time, and your participation, and I think we're really in for a treat. And I also thank Ms. Frederick for being so kind to ask me to provide the welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hill, for those wonderful opening remarks. Uh, Robert Van Warren was a prolific writer, as I'm going to mention in, 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 my, in my sort of situating of this panel. Uh, he wrote, I'm sure we can't count the number of words. Dr. Hill and I should have compared notes because I too was going to use some of those quotes that he used, so I'll skip around a bit uh, in, in my prepared remarks. Um, many people have worked very hard to bring this event to fruition. And I would like to take a moment to thank my colleagues who have been central to this project. Professor Doug Fisher and his staff, Nick Dressler and Grace Chi at Warren College, Dr. Frank Dobson of the Black Cultural Center, Dr. Tina Smith of the Office of Inclusion Initiatives and Cultural Competence, and the Warren Center's Activities Coordinator, Terry Tripp. Let's take a moment to thank these people. We are deeply honored to have our panelists with us today at Vanderbilt. I will provide some context for our program, Recovering Lost Voices, Robert Penn Warren and the US Civil Rights Movement, and introduce our speakers. They will each speak for about 20 minutes, allowing time for a question and answer period after their remarks. Following that, we'll have a reception in the lobby and hopefully continue what will be an illuminating conversation. Robert Penn Warren, an acclaimed poet, novelist, critic, and teacher, was born in Guthrie, Kentucky in 1905 and graduated summa cum laude from Vanderbilt in 1925. A prolific author across multiple genres, Warren was the first U.S. Poet Laureate and is the only person to win the Pulitzer Prize in both fiction and poetry. He spent most of his career as a faculty member at Yale University, where he retired in 1973. Robert Penn Warren died in 1989. In 1965, Random House published Warren's book, Who Speaks for the Negro? As Dr. Hill noted, Warren wrote this book to find out what he could about one of the dramatic events of the American story. Despite the volume's critical success, the New York Times named it as one of the outstanding books of the year, Who Speaks was not widely embraced by the public and went out of print in a few short years. To gather data for the book, Warren traveled across the United States in 1964 and audio taped more than 45 in-depth interviews with men and women, young and old, centrally involved in the US Civil Rights Movement, including two of our panelists today, Robert Moses and Ruth Turner Perot, and the father of our third panelists, Reverend Kelly Miller Smith, Jr. In 2012, the Warren Center, with the tremendous assistance from the Vanderbilt Library, completed an online archive that contains the digitized versions 
of the original reel-to-reel -reel recordings, as well as copies of the correspondence, transcripts, and other print materials related to his research for the book. The archive has transformed Warren's bold and imaginative creation into a vastly more accessible record of his subjects, both the famous and the forgotten. The book was originally very much Warren's creation, but over time, because of the archive, the men and women he interviewed have become the great story. Based largely on the positive response to the digital archive, Yale University Press reissued Warren's volume in 2014. Who Speaks for the Negro is the original oral history conducted and published about and during the US civil rights movement. There is no other work of its kind from the era. I will now introduce the speakers. Perhaps I should warn them that there are photographs of them behind them on the screen uh, from the time in which they were interviewed by Robert Pim Warren. Though each have illustrious careers, as I'm sure you all know, my introductions will be necessarily brief in order to allow more time for us to hear directly from our honored guests. Robert Moses is an educator and civil rights activist who graduated from Hamilton College. After earning a master's degree in philosophy at Harvard, Moses moved to the South and served as field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, working to register black voters in Mississippi as director of SNCC's Mississippi Project. In 1961, he was a freedom writer and in 1964 was the main organizer of the Freedom Summer Project with the Council of Federated Organizations. His calm leadership helped SNCC navigate the threats and violence encountered in this process, including the murder of three volunteers. Later in his career, Robert Moses received a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship and subsequently founded the Algebra Project, a national nonprofit organization that uses mathematics as an organizing tool to ensure quality public school education for every child in America. Robert Moses was interviewed by Warren about his role in the US Civil Rights Movement on February 11th, 1964 in Jackson, Mississippi. <coughs> Ruth Turner Perot graduated from Oberlin College and also received a master's degree from Harvard University. She played a key leadership role in the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, as Executive Secretary, Secretary of Cleveland CORE from 1963 to 1966. She was an influential member of CORE's National Action Council and provided key support for the formation of CORE's education and community development policies. Perot is co-founder and executive director, CEO of Summit Health Institute for Research and Education, established in 1997 to work to eliminate health disparities and assist communities of color in obtaining, obtaining optimal health. She also served from 2008 to 2013 as managing director of the National Health IT Collaborative for the underserved, founded in 2008 to help ensure that communities of color and other underserved populations benefit from health information technology initiatives. Perot is a recipient of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust's Health Hero, Healthcare Hero Award and Families USA Consumer Advocate of the Year Award. Ruth Turner Perot was interviewed by Warren about her role in the U.S. Civil Rights Movement on May 7, 1964, in Cleveland, Ohio. Kelly Miller Smith, Jr. is pastor at First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill, the same historic church led by his father from 1951 until his death in 1984. Reverend Smith grew up in Nashville and attended Vanderbilt Divinity School before earning a Master of Divinity 
from Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta in 1983. He later received a doctorate of ministry from United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. Reverend Kelly Miller Smith Sr. earned a Bachelor of Arts from Morehouse College and a Bachelor of Divinity from Howard University. In 1955, he and 12 other African American parents filed a federal lawsuit against segregation in Nashville public schools. Reverend Smith was instrumental in organizing and supporting the students taking part in the sit-ins that led to the integration of Nashville's downtown lunch counters. He also founded the Nashville Christian Leadership Council. <coughs> Smith Hall, located in Moore College on the Vanderbilt campus, pays tribute to Smith Sr., who served as assistant dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School from 1969 until his death in 1984. In addition, the Vanderbilt Special Collections houses the Kelly Miller Smith papers. Reverend Smith Sr. was interviewed by Robert Penn Warren about his role in the U.S. Civil Rights Movement on February 13, 1964, here in Nashville. And I will now stop talking, turn the floor over to our panelists, who will share with us their thoughts and comments about the U.S. Civil Rights Movement and perhaps the archive. Thank you very much. And though they're going to speak in the order in which I introduce them, so we'll start off with Robert Moses. How's everybody? Good. So I thought I would uh, tell a story first about an event and then uh, use that to kind of um, set a framework for more broadly speaking um, what's going on and what went on. So about a year before uh, Robert Penn Warren came down in the around February of 1963, uh, Kennedy is still president. Uh, Bobby Kennedy is Attorney General, and Burke Marshall is Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. Uh, I was in the car, in the SNCC car, driving from Greenwood to Greenville, and we were grease gunned. And Jimmy Travis, who was driving, caught a bullet. Um, there were three of us sitting up in the front, myself and Randolph Blackwell, uh, he had come over from Atlanta because uh, he was working with the Voter Education Project. And they were overseeing uh, and helping us with resources for our voting. So after the shooting, SNCC converged on Greenwood. And it happened that the same time that uh, Several counties in Mississippi had decided to cut off the federal commodity allotments to the sharecroppers. Um, so we raised food in Chicago. Dick Gregory flew down some plane loads of food and told the sharecroppers, look, um, you don't have your food because of the politics, so if you want some of this food, you have to go down to register. So we got hundreds of sharecroppers and day laborers uh, going down, and we were arrested. So Burke uh, had our cases removed to the federal district court in Greenville and sent John Doe down to be our lawyer. We bust over uh, sharecroppers from Greenwood to Greenville, where the federal district court was, and packed the courtroom. So I was on the witness stand, John Doerr is in front of me, and Judge, federal district judge Clayton leans over, and he just has one question. Why is SNCC taking illiterates down to register to vote? 
So basically our answer was, the country can't have its cake and eat it too. It can't have denied a whole people access to literacy through its politics and then turn around and say, well, you can't do politics because you're illiterate. So we actually won that um, struggle. It's not well known. Um, there's one part of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, which is in the nation's consciousness, the march from Selma to Montgomery. Um, there's another which is not. Um, and that's the work that uh, SNCC and CORE did in Mississippi, which pushed the Justice Department to change its strategy so that instead of going after individual registrars, they filed suit against the state of Mississippi and another against the state of Louisiana. Uh, they weren't successful in the Mississippi suit, but Judge Wisdom from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, in December, around December 22nd, just a month after Kennedy was assassinated, uh, handed down a decision in the Louisiana versus the United States and basically said that the state of Louisiana, because of its history, he actually um, went in his decision into uh, the history of Louisiana and white supremacy versus black subordination and because of that history, said that the state of Louisiana could no longer be held responsible. Um, so this was a huge shift, constitutional shift, uh, from who, who, where does the domain of responsibility lie, right, for the issue of constitutional, substantive constitutional rights. What are substantive constitutional rights and, and who, where does the actual responsibility lie with those? And of course, um, um, we are now um, back to square one almost on that issue with the Roberts Court in the Shelby decision um, because um, basically the it was through uh, the, the uh, efforts in the courts that we got the enforcement provision of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, right? So those two issues, um, education and the right to vote uh, were intertwined then and are intertwined now uh, in front of our country. Um, what I came to understand was that uh, what we were looking at is a version of sharecropper education. Um, so sharecropper education says, well, these people have been de pre-assigned work, and so we get the education together for the work that they have been pre-assigned. Right? Um, so in 1968, 400 Mexican-Americans marched out of their school in San Antonio uh, demanding better schools and better teachers. And their parents uh, took it to the, Supreme, to the court system and it ended up in the Supreme Court either in 71 or 73, Justice, Chief Justice was Powell. Um, and uh, Powell said, well look, you really can't come to the federal court system for equity relief. And the reason is there's no substantive constitutional right to an education in our Constitution. And so after that decision, the whole legal framework uh, around this issue, which of course is a continuation of Brown, right? shifted from the federal courts to the states. Uh, so there are now 45 cases in 45 states around the issue of equity, right? 
And the case that uh, was brought in New York State by the Campaign for Fiscal Equity uh, ended up at a, a federal district judge, DeGrasse, uh, who said the state of New York should put some more funds into the city. Uh, Pataki, who was the governor, appealed it. And a four-judge uh, panel said, no, um, the state constitution of New York says that we have to educate our children to do two things, serve on juries and vote. They said an eighth grade education is sufficient for that. New York City is already offering all of its students the equivalent of an eighth grade education, so they don't need more money. And one of the judges, Judge Lira, said, look, there are a lot of low paying jobs out here. Somebody's going to work those jobs, and people who work those jobs only need a certain kind of education. So the idea of sharecropper education, the idea that millions of young people are pre assigned work in this country, and we give them the education equivalent to the work for which they have pre-assigned is loud and well, right, in this country. So we tried um, working on this issue. Um, if I think about the, the civil rights movement, we were able to get Jim Crow out of three distinct areas of American life. We got it out of pub public accommodations. Um, we got it out of the right to vote. And we got it out of the National Democratic Party. That would be Fannie Lou Hamer and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Um, that went to the National Democratic Party Convention in Atlantic City in 1964. Right. We did not get it out of education. Um, so the issue of the right to vote and education is part of the unfinished business of the civil rights movement. Um, I do the algebra project. Um, and in the 1960s, we used the vote as an organizing tool for political access. Uh, in this century, um, for, for reasons which nobody really anticipated, uh, algebra has become available as an organizing tool for education and economic access. Um, so to, to see that, we have to uh, step back and look at uh, the movements we have from a planet-wide perspective. Uh, there is a sense in which the movement we had in uh, the 1960s uh, was uh, a part of a planet-wide movement uh, that you can trace uh, through World War I and World War II. Uh, if you think about those wars as sucking up colonial peoples around the planet into struggles for political democracy. Um, and so uh, after World War II, colonial peoples uh, pushed for their, their political democracy. And within this country, um, African Americans uh, were an internal colony. And one way of thinking about what we gained was uh, like colonial peoples around the planet uh, who gained their political, if not their economic voice, uh, we also gained our political, if not our economic voice. What's going on in the planet right now, uh, the planet is uh, transitioning from industrial to information age economies, right? Um, and the industrial economies which mechanize physical work um, required two literacies. And what the, the federal judge was asking us about, uh, he wasn't asking us whether the, the sharecroppers could do algebra, right? I mean, he was asking us could they read or write, right? 
And those were the literacies that were uh, needed to access the economic arrangements of the industrial and the age. And the sharecroppers basically were our serfs in this country of the industrial age, right? But information age technologies, computers, bring quantitative literacy on the table as important as reading and writing literacies. Um, and so algebra, in this country anyway, uh, becomes available as a tool to organize around for education and uh, economic access. And so the algebra project has um, begun um, that work uh, looking at the bottom quartile in this country. Now the country's dirty secret that it does not talk about is that barely 34, 35% of all children in the country who graduate high school are ready for college math for college credit. 70% close of the kids who graduate, now these are the kids who passed all our state tests and ACT and all of that, remediate college math if they go into an open enrollment college or a college that requires an exam and requires that they do college math, right? So the algebra project has been working, let me back up. It was not radical to do voter registration per se in the 1960s. It was radical to do it in the Mississippi Delta because if blacks in the Mississippi Delta got the right to vote, as it turned out, the party structure of the country had to change. I mean, what got uh, Mississippi shifted uh, was not the, the Voting Rights Act, it was the move at the National Democratic Party which said to all of the white people in Mississippi, uh, if you want to stay in this party, then you have got to open up your party to blacks in Mississippi. Um, and so that's how Senator Eastland went on the stump with Aaron Henry, who was chair of the NAACP, right? Um, that had to do with the party structure of the country. Um, so, uh, um, and I'm trying to pick up my, just lost my train of thought. I don't know if anyone's following what I'm talking about. Um, so, um, uh, well, I can't pick up my train of thought, so I'll go to another train, another car. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, how much time I got? I'm just about out of time, so that was a good time to lose my train of thought. <laughs> I would like for you all to, um, good afternoon everybody. Good afternoon. I'd like for you all to kind of walk back in time with me and um, join me in the office in Cleveland Corps on, in Huff on Crawford Road as I receive this elderly gentleman. I think he had a bow tie. The um, elderly white gentleman who came into my office. And let me paint a picture for you. I had just come from a series of demonstrations around school integration in Cleveland. I, you know, Cleveland, Ohio is in the north. Well, we used to call it up south <laughs> because there was so much going on that was reminiscent of what our brothers and sisters in the south were experiencing. Now, the demonstration of Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Oops. Now it's there. <laughs> it's on. Okay, sorry. Um, I said I want you to walk down memory lane with me. Okay. Um, 
I had just come to the office and we had been in a series of demonstrations. The Cleveland, Ohio situation was unbelievable in the sense that we'd been fighting the fight about school integration simply because we had overcrowded schools in the African American neighborhoods, underutilized schools in other parts of the city. And we said, well, you know, at least we can benefit um, from integration and also bring children into those situations which are certainly better for their education. But the school board in its wisdom decided if they were gonna take our children from our neighborhoods and put them into white schools, they were gonna keep them in separate rooms, make sure they had separate recesses, and have separate lunches. Does that sound familiar? So we protested that. And so the school board said, okay, well, here's the answer to that. We're just gonna build you some more schools in the African American communities. Now we don't have a problem with neighborhood schools, but in this instance, the schools were built on land that was insufficient. They were going to be crowded from the beginning. And so it's time, we felt it was time to protest, and we did. And one of the demonstrations, and I think there's a picture of it in some of the public press release. I'm lying in a ditch, um, and our core chapter, which, and we planned this very carefully. We planned all of our demonstrations carefully. There was no such thing as spontaneous demonstrations. Um, we were going to stop the construction of that school. And so I was in the ditch with several other people, and one of our members had stopped a truck by wrapping himself around the axle, and another person had positioned himself in front of a bulldozer, and then our dear friend Bruce Clunder had put himself in back of the bulldozer. And we were able to stop the truck, and gratefully, since I was in the ditch, the man who was dumping dirt stopped dumping, but the bulldozer did not stop. And he backed up and he crushed Bruce Clunder. So I'm coming from that experience. We had a huge demonstration at the time, people were we tried to kind of calm things down, but people were obviously, and for good reason, very angry. Um, we had a 92% school boycott protesting the whole situation, and so I'm walking into the office where this gentleman is waiting. And I had the opportunity, and I hope you all will, uh, to listen to the archives, because it's nothing like hearing yourself as a 25-year-old I'm well over that now, <laughs> 50 years plus that. <laughs> but to the idea that I was as calm as a cucumber, this thing and talking to this gentleman who was asking me some very provocative questions. In some cases, I could have used another word about the questions. <laughs> and I was calm as I could be and thoughtful and thorough in my answers. I said, I couldn't do that now. Uh, but I think what that says is that when you are in a position of being a part of something that's bigger than yourself, you learn to rise to the occasion. So listen to the archives, not just my interview, but Bob's interview and Reverend Smith, Kelly Smith's interview. And they're, they're, it's a real treasure trove, it really is to get a sense of what we were thinking in those days. Now, I have to say that if I had the chance to correct the record about what I said at the time, I would. Um, and I think the first thing I would do was challenge the, some of the assumptions of Robert Penn Warren. And he was very assertive about his assumptions, and I wasn't as assertive then as I am now, so I didn't push back as hard. But one of the assumptions he made was, and he talked about the apathy of the African American community. And of course, you can't even use that word to describe people who are oppressed. You might say they are quiescent, depressed, oppressed, but you can't say they're apathetic. Because as soon as we got a chance, we blew up. <laughs> and we got in those demonstrations, and we, we had you know people everywhere, they, uh, all over the Cleveland, Ohio were demonstrating, so there was nothing apathetic about it. It was just that at that particular time, people were either biding their time or they were just building up um, the, the sense of frustration. So that was one thing I would have challenged about him. But he, and the other thing he said, he talked about people overreaching. Well, if you've got a 
a foot on your back, you're going to get do whatever you have to do to get it off. I think the word overreaching is probably inappropriate. And But the most inappropriate thing, and I should say, the thing I challenged him most on and didn't quite get my point across, was his discussion of the Gunnar Gunner Myrdal's proposition that if you would just compensate the slaveholders, we could have had a different outcome as far as the Civil War was concerned and so on. Some of the people in the book that he interviewed said that was a preposterous idea. I didn't say that. And I actually ultimately agreed if it was the only way that would be acceptable. But now, no. How many of you have seen Roots? Anybody in this room seen Roots? Anybody see 12 Years a Slave? Slavery was the most horrific, horrendous, terrorizing, brutalizing experience that anyone could ever have. And the idea that you would compensate someone for having put people through that, quite frankly, would be completely preposterous. I equate it to someone coming into a bank and saying, give me all your money. You give them the money, they spend it, and they come back and say, I want the rest. And you give it to them. So those, just in terms, now, what did I like about that interview with Robert Penn Warren? I enjoyed the opportunity to think deeply about some issues that I didn't have time to think about. I was moving from one demonstration to the next. We were in the midst, in the streets. I mean, it was helpful to be able to be contemplative, and I was pleased to know that I actually could be contemplative um, in those interviews and, and present certain points of view. So it was a very valuable experience, and notwithstanding the fact that I would change, the one thing I would also change about an answer I gave, he asked me, what I thought of Dr. Martin Luther King. And with the arrogance of youth and the position that many of us who were younger activists at the time, we said, well, we didn't, I didn't think he went far enough. I didn't think he understood how things were in the North. I didn't think he understood the kind of systems that we were dealing with and the kind of systemic changes that we needed to make. Anybody ever hear Dr. Martin Luther King's presentation to Riverside on April 4th? I took every word of that back. <laughs> I would have taken every word of that back because if, if Martin understood, every, he understood the three isms and he talked about it, capitalism, imperialism, and racism in a very profound way. So if I had a chance to clean the record up and change my answer on that question, I would have done that because I know now that I was wrong as two left shoes. <laughs> now, what what, what, did I, what did I bring away from the movement? Um, a clear understanding of the importance of institutions. I tried to do my part. I, I established a, an organization called the Black Child Development Education Center, which is now the National Black Child Development Institute. And it's been around for quite a few years. Not with me necessarily, but it's, I got it started. Um, in 1997, I established the Summit Health Institute for Research and Education, a vehicle to address the issue of health disparities, the gaps between people of color and other people in this country, and also to work on getting everybody's health better. And we've been around since 1997. I'll come back to that in a little while in terms of telling you some of the things we're doing there. So I know that the, the key thing was the building institutions. Bob's talking about the algebra project. That's an institution that is crucial. We need more, many, many, many more. But it is uh, something I've learned. We have to have institutions that will allow us to provide on an ongoing, sustained basis the resources and the services that our, our folks need. The second thing I learned was the importance of policy. Um, CORE actually offered a major policy initiative. It was the Community Self-Determination Act. And it was one of the most far-reaching visionary. And, and my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Nashani Frazier, who's here. And Nashani, would you stand up for a minute? She knows all about this. 
she's written a book about CORE. And uh, if you want to know about CORE and all of its various phases, you want to talk to Dr. Nishani. But the point is that that act was extremely, uh, it was a major contribution. It was in the Nixon administration. If you ever get a chance, and I'm sure she'll make it possible for you to have a chance to understand and look at the Community Self-Determination Act. I got involved in, per in policy after I left CORE by getting involved in health reform, um, dealing with the Clinton administration, bringing the points of view and perspectives of people of color, trying to make that uh, part of the Clinton administration's health reform. It crashed, as you know, didn't quite go forward, but we did the same thing with uh, President Obama's efforts. And there are a couple things in there that we really did work hard for. Uh, for example, uh, making certain that we collected data and reported data by race and ethnicity so we could determine how well we're doing in relation to closing gaps. That's in the Obamacare, we call it Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, Section 4302, contains information about the importance of federal programs collecting data by race and ethnicity. So it's kind of a way of showing you that if you keep a focus on policy, you can actually have some impact. So that's a very important thing to do. Build institutions, that taught me, I learned that at the movement. Working on policy, and the third and most important thing is continuing to build movements. How much time do I have? Seven minutes, okay. I like to say that um, if I were going to crystallize the lessons of the movements, I would say it's all about love, not the kind of love you think I'm talking about. Love, leadership, O, L, leadership, O, opportunity, V, value, E, engagement. I've come to believe that if you have those ingredients, and, and I'll explain what I mean by those four things. Uh, you can build a successful movement and you can demonstrate that people have power to change things. And I think one of the most valuable experiences I had in the movement was to be able to confirm for myself that people have power to change things. Okay, what do I mean by leadership? Well, I mean, leadership has to be inspirational, theoretical, and analytical. And Again, Dr. Frazier has a fabulous idea about how we can improve the analytical capacity of leaders of the civil rights movement. Um, Bob has talked about the theoretical framework. You have to have it. You also have some people who can stir folks, stir folks and stir things up. And whether that's James Farmer, who was my mentor, or Dr. King, or so many others who had the ability to inspire people and, and get them fired up. So leadership is crucial. And so is opportunity, and what do I mean by that? Well, Bull Connor and his dogs represented an opportunity, okay? And opportunities can be both positive and negative. The Affordable Care Act that's been passed, which is a health, the most significant health reform in 50, 60, 80 years, that's an opportunity. We have when we, have a, when we have a vehicle that you can organize around and organize to implement, that becomes a, an opportunity. In our case, when we're dealing with health, the very fact that African Americans die sooner um, and have more, more diseases is an opportunity because it gets, allows us to get people's attention. What about values? Um, black lives matter. That's a value. All men and women are created equal. That's a value. And when we talk about health, we say, my body is a temple. That's a value. And you have to have a value. You have to give some S something to, to help people understand why it's so important. And then finally, in, on the engagement side, uh, there are two ways to engage people. In the movement, we got things moving and people came in. You know the song, People, get moving, there's a train of coming. If in fact you get something moving, you can get people involved. And that happened in Cleveland and help, happened elsewhere. It happened in Mississippi. If it hadn't been for the folks going down there to get things stirred up, and as Dick said, if you want to eat, you go register. That's, that's movement from, 
getting things started from the outside as an outside catalyst, as it were. And then there's another kind of engagement, the kind we're doing in Washington, D.C. now around the issue of health. And that is we're helping people who have diabetes and hypertension understand that they can take charge of their health by learning to eat differently, move more, handle their stress. And when they do that, and also become informed about their rights under the new law, and enter the health system as informed consumers, they become empowered. When people become empowered about their health, they can become empowered about other things too. The old organization theory, you know, which uh, in fact, President Obama was a, president, was a community organizer, so he knows this theory. You meet people where they are. You help them solve the problems they have, and then you bring them along to another level of engagement. I think I'm gonna stop there, because I don't want you to cut me off. <laughs> um, but I hope we'll get a chance to have some questions. Um, but remember, uh, movements are crucial. We have to have them. We're at a very critical time in our history. You saw the results yesterday. Uh, we must be engaged, and all we need is love. Leadership, opportunity, values, and engagement. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here and to uh, share with this very distinguished uh, panel and to uh, have this opportunity to talk uh, a little bit about my dad and some of the things that were associated with his life, his living, and the contributions that uh, he made, not only here at the city of Nashville, to Vanderbilt University, as well as to the nation and to other parts of the world as well. I was, uh, I wrestled with how I wanted to approach. Obviously, I'm not the one who was engaged at the point where my, uh, my father was. I was simply a child that was growing up during this time. Uh, many persons have read and, and heard about, perhaps through uh, news accounts, and even during this month, Black History Month, heard of many things which have happened that uh, affected uh, not only African American communities, but also this nation. Uh, we were living it. We lived it in terms of our own houses. We lived it in terms of our own lives. We lived it in terms of conversations around the dinner table. We lived it when we saw the stress uh, that was going on in terms of not only my father, my mother, my mother who is here, um, but also just uh, uh, realizing that it was a different time, particularly during the early 60s, when there was this very strong heat of, of challenges, uh, not only here in Nashville, but other places as well. Uh, as, I, as I was listening uh, to uh, the tapes of when my father uh, was interviewed by Robert Penn Warren, a lot of things came uh, across my mind, a lot of thoughts, and it, uh, some things were also crystallized and confirmed in terms of my thoughts uh, and understandings of that particular era. I remember once asking my dad the question uh, after hearing of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, being arrested and watching on the news and hearing and knowing of others who had been beaten and uh, some of the other things that they had to experience. I asked my dad, had he ever been arrested because of what was going on in terms of the movement? And his response to me was somewhat surprising. I must also confess a little disappointing when he told me, no, he had never been arrested. <laughs> I was looking for some war story of uh, how it was when you know, he was arrested and how they were in jail and they were probably singing, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Um, but, uh, but he said, no, that wasn't, that wasn't uh, a part of his own experience. But then I, I began to understand and to know that it was not necessarily in, uh, it was not um, 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 uh, a lack of nobility or, or a lack of a badge of honor and that uh, he was not arrested. But understanding that there were some other roles that people had to play that were very crucial and very important in terms of the movement. Martin Luther King Jr. understood this. Jesse Jackson understood it. As you mentioned, uh, Barack Obama, he understood it uh, from his own political perspective, but others who have tried to galvanize movements understood that there were different roles, a lot of roles that people had to play. Among the roles that my father realized that he had to play here in Nashville 
was that of a negotiator. Among the things that was going on, that was going on here in Nashville is the fact that uh, the lunch counters were not allowing uh, uh, the persons of color to come and to sit and to share and to eat as other patrons who would come in there. Perhaps many of you or some of you have seen uh, the documentary that was done by NBC that was entitled The White Paper, The Sit-Ins, where uh, Chet Huntley uh, came uh, to Nashville and uh, they interviewed persons and they were showing some of the, the tension of some of the things that were going on here in Nashville in 1960. Many of us would say that's even within our own lifetimes that we saw and experienced and saw these things happening here in Nashville. There were also uh, department stores that would allow uh, blacks to work in the stores, but would not allow them to shop as regular customers. There were, um, you know, not only lunch counters, but restaurants that would discriminate against persons who they were allowed to eat there. The other things, as you heard mentioned as well, that uh, the public school systems had their own segregated ways of doing things, and my father and mother were among those who filed a uh, suit against the school system in order to allow for the schools to be desegregated here in Nashville. And all these things were, uh, were a part of what was necessary uh, to see the movement move forward. But as my father's role was, was to sit at tables with persons and to have conversations, some very hard, uh, drawn out, very taxing kinds of conversations with persons uh, around these tables. Many times, and people don't always realize this, it is not what is seen in terms of the dramatic things that we see on TV and the other things of that nature that really affect the change. It's when people with, who may have very vastly different ideologies will sit across the table, not even knowing the world that each other uh, may, be, uh, may have come from. And in the midst of that conversation, they can map out some sort of agreement, some sort of understanding that would be theoretically palatable for all persons uh, on all sides. And one, one clear il il illustration of that, as I go back even prior to the Nashville movement, was um, in the Montgomery bus, bus boycott. Some of you may recall that the issue was not really, uh, well, the, the initial thrust was not necessarily to desegregate the buses so people can sit anywhere. The real issue initially was so that if a black patron comes and gets on a bus and the back of the bus is filled, that they can sit someplace else and not be made to move. And so therefore, it wasn't really trying to break down uh, the system. It's just really trying to make some sense of accommodation. Similarly, uh, that was something that was here in Nashville, that you know, kind of finding a middle ground that would be uh, plausible for, for, uh, for, for white uh, business owners to allow for African Americans uh, to come and to share in a way that did not seem to be so disruptive to what they were trying to do. But because of the fact that they were taking hard lines, that's what happened in Montgomery, that's what happened here in Nashville, that uh, it caused um, uh, those who were on the other side of the table to press harder, not just for some middle ground, but for uh, the, the, the full thrust of what it is that would make a difference. And those are the kinds of things that were a part of the negotiation. So they would sit there and they would try to find where can we come to an agreement that would allow for, uh, that would allow for change to happen so that persons could eat wherever they had the money to eat, that they could shop wherever they had the money to shop, where they could go to places. They did not have to worry about seg segregated water fountains, segregated um, uh, restrooms and things of that nature. These were a part of the negotiations and my father was very, very skilled uh, in terms of that. So oftentimes he may not be the one out there uh, dodging bricks and rocks and things of that nature that were being thrown, but he was at the table negotiating and talking with people. Among the things that he stated in his interview with Robert Penn Warren was the fact that when you sit at these negotiating tables, you have to understand that the person who's on the other side of the table comes from a totally and radically different world. They did not understand what your world was. Even what my father stated in there is that for many of them, they never sat at a place where they saw blacks as being equals to them. They saw them only as janitors and as maids and uh, persons who uh, were, were seen in menial and, and, and menial kinds of positions. But to see someone sitting at across the table who, whose skin complexion may be different than what theirs was, but yet had 
as much passion about what they were believing, what they were trying to express, as uh, those who were the business owners, was a new world for them. And what he suggested needed to happen was the fact that, that, that there needed to be uh, an understanding on the part of each party to place himself into the world of the other person, to try to understand where he or she was coming from. And therefore, perhaps it, can, it brought a different level of sensibility in terms of the discussion as part of, a part of the discussion of what was going on and what was happening uh, during that time. Part of the challenge um, was, so we needed to understand that there were multiple roles that needed to happen in any movement, whether it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even in this present time, we must understand that not all the roles are to be out there being seen on the streets with, with uh, demonstration signs and laying in front of ditches and things of that nature, but there needed to be others who would take time to work on other angles because you never know what angle might cause the breakthrough. Sometimes the breakthrough did come through the judicial system. Sometimes the breakthrough did come through uh, the public demonstrations and the protests that were there. Sometimes the breakthroughs did come through just the negotiations that were done behind closed doors. See, part of the challenge that we sometimes forget, even when we're trying to affect movements, is that sometimes people have backed themselves so far into corners that they don't have, and they've done it publicly, that they don't have a public way of getting out of it. And so they, they, they're, they're left to some other systems that may come into play, some other institutions that may be able to break the deadlock. And that's, that's part of what I've seen, even in some of the rhetoric in the current political uh, campaigns for president. There, there's some public statements that are being made and, and uh, some public things that are being said about folk. And that, 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 that you know, people, politicians have learned that you don't really apologize for what you say. You just hope that the, the public specter of it uh, goes away. And so that, um, so that others will, uh, will forget about the fact that you said something as asinine and stupid as what you've said. What we continue to hear, we hear uh, even on today and <laughs> other days of that nature. But it happens, but, but the real difference oftentimes comes what happens in closed door sessions where people can say asinine things, but it's not out there in the public ear, in the public eye so that they would have an opportunity to, uh, to have to, 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 uh, to have a foot in the mouth, uh, but yet can, can, can come away and stand tall and to stand firm in terms of what they believe. So we understand that that was a part of what was necessary and what was going on. Among the interesting things that my father stated in the interview was the fact that sometimes the resistance did not come from white businessmen when we were talking about integration. He said sometimes it came from the black businessmen as well. Uh, the reason being is that uh, because if uh, lunch counters and, and, and restaurants and stores uh, and other places were opening up to, to uh, African Americans to be able to shop uh, in those places, that means that that would take away some of the businesses from those who were people of color. And, um, and, and among the things that they had to learn uh, in terms of establishing um, uh, a seeking rights is that there are some things that we gain, some things that we lose. Even as we talk about the whole issue of education, we, we've heard it from um, Dr. Moses as well as uh, Dr. Perot, uh, Sister Perot, uh, that uh, I'm not sure if you're a doctor or not. We're going to give you one today, okay? Uh, that's one of the things preachers can do. They can give doctors to anybody they want to, so you have one. Okay. But we also learned in terms of, of, of education, there were things that were gained in terms of, of, of education. There were things that were ter uh, gained in terms of exposure and opportunities, uh, newer classroom buildings, uh, newer books, uh, newer labs and things of that nature. But there were also things that were lost when the schools were desegregated. There were things like, uh, like for instance, school teachers actually going to church with you, living in your community. Teachers that would call your parents and let them know that there were some problems with little Johnny today uh, because of the fact that um, you know Johnny messed up. And so there was a kind of relationship, there was a different kind of community that was there that was, that was almost guaranteed that was going to be there to assist and to help. That perhaps was one of the things that was lost. But we also have to also ask ourselves, what, what are we allowing, what will we allow to be the collateral damage in any movement? What are we willing to lose in order to gain? 
you know, sometimes you have to lose some of the battle. Sometimes you have to lose some of the rights. Sometimes you have to lose some of the power in order to gain the kinds of things that you needed to gain in order for things uh, to be better. So the black businessmen, workers, and, and there are still some ripple effects. Unfortunately, there are not as many different kinds of just basic black businesses that are there. Not a whole lot of uh, black restaurants, even here in the city of Nashville and other places of that nature. Let me say something else that's not in my notes, but I wanted to say it as, I, as, I, as I've thought over the past few weeks. I am a part of a, of, a, of a group that meets once a month that's called Leadership Nashville. Some of you perhaps have been a part of Leadership Nashville uh, um, uh, group. And it is an organization that seeks to give orientation to groups of persons who are in leadership roles in various aspects of the city of Nashville that talks about various, the various things that have happened, not only historically, but things that are going on where Nashville is right now. Among the things that we oftentimes hear, uh, and we hear it in the news, we heard it in the last mayoral uh, election, that Nashville is the next it city. Nashville is this, Nashville, and Nashville is all of that. But as I was listening to a lot of the presentations in Leadership Nashville, I realized that so much of what makes Nashville the next it city is what happened back in the 60s in terms of the desegregating of, of places to allow for an understanding that persons from different cultures and different exposures, different experiences are welcomed here in the Nashville. They can, they can establish businesses, they can work for various companies, they can move up in terms of, of the structures of companies, even though Nashville still has a long way to go, for, for instance, in the finance uh, component of our community, where there are not, there's still not many minorities and, and, uh, and, and even women who are serving in the financial sector of our community. Um, and, and, and some aspects of the business community. There are some who move up and to share in this position. Let me, let me even say this, and, and uh, I'm not on the payroll of a bad so I can say this and I can walk out of here and not have any problems with, with it. Um, <laughs> but even for them to get to the year 2015, and at this point determine that we need to have someone to serve in the role of being very specific about diversity issues. And uh, even though Vanderbilt has done many things over the course of years, but that they finally get into the point, okay, perhaps it's something we need to look at and to address in a different kind of way. We must understand the importance of things still happening, things still pushing forward. But Nashville has gotten to the place where it is now because of the efforts of persons who are willing to sit around lunch counters and to allow themselves to be brutalized, allow themselves to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to be burned, to be thrown in jail, to be treated less than human beings because of what happened in the 60s that we're able to sit here in Vanderbilt. Because you have to recall, Vanderbilt didn't always play a very stellar role in what was going on in terms of the civil rights movement, in terms of the, of the, of the sit-ins. Um, uh, James Lawson, who was a student here at Vanderbilt, uh, was arrested coming out of the church building of uh, which our congregation was, was housed at that time. Um, but he was arrested and put out of school because of his involved in, what, involved in what was going on in the movement. Vanderbilt has since gotten to the point and, and, and had to search his own soul and search his own consciousness and, and understanding that there were some ethical issues that, that they failed to accomplish. And we all have to understand that. We have to all understand that there are parts that we all have failed. And even my father mentioned in the interview that there were some things that he failed in terms of his own movement. Among the things that he stated there, that one of the things he wished had happened uh, was that there had been a uh, stronger theological undergirding about the, the movement. There was that, but it was more almost tangential, almost superficial. But instead of basing the movement of the sit-ins, basing the movement of the struggle in a very strong theological basis, perhaps caused it not to have even as much of a strength, as much a stronger stance than it did have. Because we understand that whenever there is a movement, I think Sister uh, uh, Perot mentioned it as well, that there has to be something that has to be bigger than us, bigger than something we can tangibly touch, bigger than something that we can, that we can wrap our arms around. And we understand it as, 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 a, as a person who's a part of the church, uh, understand that, it, that, that the church itself and the theology of the church and and the movement of the church is always bigger than any one individual, any person, any church, 
any, 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 any denomination, any religion, any faith. It has to be bigger. And if the movement had been even more uh, immersed and, and built upon that foundation, there perhaps would have been even greater strides that had been made back in the 60s. Now, now there were things that were done. You know, they did teach them the principles of nonviolence, and that's a very difficult thing. And I've, and whenever I talk with persons of this current uh, generation about the whole business of nonviolence, they said, "No, that couldn't have been me. You know, I would have been a very violent person." And even there were persons back in that era who said, among the reasons why they did not get involved in the sit-ins was because of the fact that you no, know, they knew they could not tolerate that, and so they told them, you need to stay at home. <laughs> because of the fact that you are going to create the kinds of issues that are going to be the problem. My father also mentioned in an interview, one of the things that we had to realize that caused, uh, that, that, that became part of what helped us to be a, a nonviolent movement is because we didn't have any weapons to have violence with. <laughs> you know, we didn't have the guns, we did not have the artillery. You're coming up against policemen, you're coming up against dogs, you're coming up against these other things. And so you do not have that which you can fight fire with fire. And they found that to be a part of the, the, the great methodology that helped them to be able to accomplish what uh, they were able, uh, they were able uh, to accomplish. There were, um, uh, initially, uh, the movement was not intended to be a student movement. Uh, among the things that was, met, that was mentioned in the interview, it was not mentioned, it was really uh, uh, those who were leaders within the community, adults, that had gathered and, and they were meeting and talking and beginning to, uh, to, uh, to grapple with the issues and trying to find what is the best approach to them addressing the issues of discrimination, the issues of, of segregation here in the city of Nashville. And it was Reverend Jim Lawson who did say, well, why not use the students? And my father said that, you know, hey, that may not be such a bad idea. Because even though uh, uh, students were students, they were in school, but they did not have uh, the same kind of uh, liabilities as they would have in terms of a business person or a person who's, who's a professor or a person who's had other kinds of uh, allegiances and obligations to the community. And it's when they began to involve the students in the movement that it became the kind of national headline, the kind of thing that allowed for the movement to move to the place that it, that it was able to go. It was seeing students being beaten. It was they seen Students being robbed, it's seeing students being thrown in jail, seeing students who are on the bus riding, uh, or uh, you know, uh, as a freedom rider. You're seeing the students engage at that level. Here it is, at, at, uh, as they are fledgling persons in terms of just trying to understand the life and trying to understand what it is they were going to do that's going to make a difference and create a purpose for their own lives and living. And yet they were finding themselves being at the core of what helped to cause a change, uh, not only in the 60s, but also in, in this nation. There were times when we were growing up uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, we felt the tension of what was going on. Uh, there was a house here in Nashville that was bombed. One of the attorneys uh, for the students, uh, who, uh, who was representing one of the students, his house was bombed while he and his wife and family were sleeping in the back part of the house. The blast of the house was so strong it blew out uh, windows at the hospital across the street. Fortunately, he and his family uh, were, were, were not harmed. That was uh, uh, attorney Z. Alexander Luby. But there were times we received bomb threats at our own house. And we had to uh, get up in the middle of the night and go and stay with friends because of the fact that, that there were uh, things that were going on that we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know if our house was going to be next or whatever the case may be. There were times when uh, my sisters had to deal with persons who were uh, sicking dogs on them. Now, you know, I was, as I was thinking earlier today, that I wonder if it was because boys were just being bad boys or it was because of the fact that they were being bad boys to these black girls who were walking to school trying to get an education. And so there were a lot of, th that's about my time? Okay. So there were a lot of things that happened that caused us to, uh, to realize that what happened during the 60s still has its effect, uh, has its, it's still bearing fruit of what's going on in today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm not sure if this mic is on or not, but we do have some time left, which is why I wanted to keep track of all of our time so that we could open up the floor to our audience, many of whom are students here at Vanderbilt, to ask questions. And please feel free to ask your question, but would you walk up to the mic so we can all hear you?
Hello, everyone. My name is Max. Um, I'm actually a staff member here at Vanderbilt. Um, I'm glad I came today. <clears throat> Ms. Burrow and I actually lived on the same street in Fort Washington, Maryland. Uh, I have some questions for those of you who were involved during the civil rights movement, um, partly pertaining to well, what today is our current, uh, the current race for the presidency in this country. And uh, so a couple of days ago, my, uh, former Secretary of State uh, Madeleine Albright said there is a quote unquote special place in hell for women that don't help each other. Um, in the same breath, uh, another super big fem uh, feminist, feminist activist um, made a claim according to which there is a need for women currently to help um, in the race in order for Hillary Clinton to become president. And I'd like to know, since you guys were president in that time, what was the role of active feminists in the civil rights um, fight? Because there have been many, many occasions where um, the new wave of feminists in our generation have been sort of asking or requiring of other minorities to quote and to support uh, what is their cause, and without necessarily, um, I don't know, seeing the importance of intersectionality. So yeah, I don't know, how did feminists get involved in the civil rights movement, or as far as you can remember? I have to, I have to assume, uh, Jordan, that you're talking about white feminists, because obviously black feminists were very much involved in Well, yeah, I'm very much talking about white feminists. I okay. didn't necessarily, because, uh, currently, there, there's sort of a divide uh, within the feminist movement where we have um, white feminists that are, uh, you know, very much uh, represented by uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and then we see the younger, younger women who are, although feminists, more and more support supporters of uh, Bernie Sanders certainly understand the political context for your question. But let me go back to say that at the point in time that we were working, white feminists were not visible as feminists. They were participating in the movement as white committed, as I like to say, the white committed. Mm -hmm. um, but they, frankly, in our movement, in, in Cleveland in particular, they did not play leadership roles because it was pretty understood that leadership should be provided by people of color and African Americans in particular. Um, so the feminist movement actually emerged somewhat after the okay. civil rights movement, if you recall. I'm, well, maybe you don't recall, you're too young. <laughs> but but it, more toward the end of the 60s as a movement per se. Now, I'm not qualified to speak about the level of integration within the feminist movement, except my impression was there was always a challenge uh, in terms of real integration because the issues facing black women were very often different from the issues that white women seem to experience. So I won't comment on that, but I can say as far as the movement is concerned, that was a black women's movement uh, with some support from white women, but not in leadership roles. Gotcha, all right, thank you. Hello. So um, you might uh, Google Casey Hayden, uh, Casey Hayden, C-A-S-E-Y-H-A-Y-D-E-N. So Casey was from Texas. She was white, um, and she was very active both in SNCC and in uh, SDS, the Students for Democratic Society. And uh, she um, uh, began writing about the issue of women uh, in the movement back in 1965, and um, is um, thought in, in many ways a, um, an initiator of what became the feminist movement. But the deeper point I, I'd like to call your attention to um, is for you to Google Fannie Lou Hamer. Do you know that name, or? So, when um, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party went to Atlantic City um, to challenge the regular Democratic Party, the white party, and I think this is a deeper point about what's going on in the presidential elections today, uh, rather than the issue of uh, feminism. Um, 
Lyndon Bain Johnson was not afraid of Dr. King's testimony before the Credentials Committee. He was afraid of a sharecropper, um, a lady, a black woman, who had spent her life on the Marlowe Plantation in, uh, outside of Ruleville in Sunflower County, Mississippi. Right? And so when it came time for her to testify, he went to the Rose Garden and announced that he had something to say to the country. Um, and it was not what he had to say, it was what he felt he had to do, which was prevent the country from listening to this black woman sharecropper, right? Um, it didn't work because they uh, reproduced her testimony on the evening news, right? <laughs> and um, they um, just bombarded the convention with telegrams, right? And the point was that uh, Mrs. Hamer, so there's a difference between advocating on behalf of uh, people or their rights and demanding um, your rights yourselves because you are in the position and uh, you, you feel it in your bones. So Mrs. Hamer lived that and she had it in her bones. There was nothing that she could say that was in any way inauthentic, mm -hmm. and her authenticity couldn't be denied, right? And so, um, to some respects, we owe the, the big political transformation, which is playing itself out on the stage now, right, um, to this black woman sharecropper who forced um, the country to pay attention and forced Johnson and the Democratic Party um, to push out of the Democratic Party all those people that Trump is now uh, outing in the Republican Party, right? Um, and the issue of this country of, I mean, you have to go all the way back to 1875 when whites, um, just through terror and violence and murder, right, took over the Mississippi State Legislature um, and ousted Albert Ames, who had been elected by the blacks, um, um, impeached him as their governor, and set up the situation um, which is leading to what we have now, right, um, with Trump, right? Um, the situation where the South was to be just one political party based on white superiority. Now what changed that was Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, which pushed right, the whole white South out of the Democratic Party right, and into the Republican Party. And Trump is outing them now, right? He's, he's you know, Trump is the equivalent of pitchfork Ben Tillman, right, 1900. Uh, got up on the Senate floor, the senator from South Carolina, and said, we did it, folks. And mm -hmm. if, if, if somebody else didn't tell you we did it, I'm telling you we did it, right? Um, we were not going to be a people who were uh, going to be uh, over by black people uh, in terms of our politics. And we got them out of there by any way we could. And we don't apologize for doing that, right? Um, so. Trump can't say that about black people. He can say that about immigrants now, right? Um, but it's the same situation. And, and the problem of the country um, as to the idea that it has to encompass in one of its major national political parties um, this kind of um, uh, racism and uh, just uh, inhumanity uh, is coming out, right? I mean, the country's going to have to deal with it, right? But it's a problem that's been festering for 150 years. And that's the problem that, I mean, feminism is not the problem in, in this current election. Let me just do one quick footnote to uh, the, the Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer came from the same uh, part of the Delta that, uh, of Mississippi that my father did. My father actually did the eulogy for uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. And so we've had that family connection. Th thank all of you for, for your incredible remarks and for calling us back to this time and to this book. 
As you were speaking, Mr. Moses, I was thinking about uh, the late professor in Daisha Ida Mae Holland's book, From the Mississippi Delta, where she talks about when you came to Greenwood, Mississippi, and, and she's someone that I got a chance to know a little bit before she passed, and she would be another name um, that you would want to read about. She was someone who wasn't a part of the intelligentsia. She later became that. But she was a young person who was out on the street helping to lead folks. Um, but my question has to do with this whole question of love, but also questions of fear and courage and the grassroots, because so much of the time we read about names. But can any of you talk about the grassroots, the people that we don't hear about or read about, and their role in the struggle then and now? I know we can all do that, but I, I would love to be able to share with you that in Cleveland, our movement was essentially a grassroots movement. I can tell you about uh, blind Chuck Burton, who was unemployed and was at every single demonstration. And, uh, Betty Gant, mother of six, who on welfare. Um, was, uh, there were just so many, so many who in many cases, quit their jobs in order to be a part of that movement. So uh, that's who the movement was. And, and we often make the point, you know, we know about Dr. King, we know about Rosa Parks, we know about the luminaries, and they, are, they deserve to be luminaries. But we don't know, and we need to know, all the many, many hundreds, hundreds of people. Who, I'll never forget the lady when I went down to Selma to be in the second march. The, the person who allowed us to stay at her place was a school teacher who I know lost her job as a result of having done that. Nobody knows her name. I unfortunately can't remember it myself. But this is the kind of thing, and I know Bob has hundreds and hundreds of stories along those lines, but that's who the movement was. That's who the movement, and we, and we must celebrate the fact that it was never just the top folks who got all the visibility, never. Hello. So I'll tell you one story. Um, so Webb Owens was the treasurer of the NACP in Macomb, Mississippi. Um, and he kept his, the money in his back pocket, right? Because obviously you couldn't put it in a bank, right? So he had to be a person that the community trusted, right? Um, I got to Webb um, through C.C. Bryant and Amzi Moore. So Amzi Moore was the uh, head of the NACP in Cleveland, Mississippi. Um, and Amzi was the one who told me and uh, also uh, talked to SNCC um, about what the students should do, that they should bring their sit-in movement to Mississippi, but not do public accommodations, but that they should actually work on the right to vote. And CC. Um, saw a little blurb in Jet Magazine that SNCC was going to send some voter registration workers to AMSI and wrote him a letter and AMSI sent me down to CC. So um, Webb would come by every morning and pick me up and for two weeks we just went around look, uh, talking to anybody who did any business in the black community asking for five and ten dollars. But you had to have someone in the community that the community trusted that if they gave him five or ten dollars, then what he said that money would be spent for would actually be what the money was going to be spent for, right? So C.C. Bryan, Webb Owens, Amzie Moore, and then uh, E.W. Steptoe, who was out in the rural area in Amick County in Mississippi, um, so the movement in Mississippi was built on um, the people, it was a kind of guerrilla warfare. One way to think about your question, um, it, the movement was a kind of guerrilla warfare. Well, to do a guerrilla warfare, you need a community base. You have to have a base in the, in the community uh, which you can disappear into and now and again emerge from and a base in which you can uh, sustain yourself, right? Your emotional, cultural self. And um, so that base is the only time in my life where 
any time, day or night. I, I could go drive someplace, knock on a door, it didn't matter how late. And they would, I was gonna get a bed to sleep in, people were gonna feed me, and they were gonna watch my back, right? So that base um, all across the state was what made the movement possible. One last question, because we have a reception outside where we can continue our conversation um, together. So please, let's hear your question. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. It's sort of a comment and a question. <clears throat> I so appreciate all the richness of your histories and relaying that to us. But um, I was a civil rights worker in the 60s, and I just wanted, my question comes with a little bit of a comment. But Dr. King, when you made the statement about reaching out to students, well, I was part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and Dr. King had asked Hosea Williams and some of the people to write letters to the universities to seek students to become involved, because if white students were involved, that the momentum and the risk and the danger might change. And so I'll those of us met this summer in Atlanta, a 50-year reunion, who had been all over the United States in different communities. For me, it was Peach County in Georgia, but voter registration and you know harassment. But living with African-American woman who was a janitor at Fort Valley College and seeing her kids pick peaches and come home at the end of the day with quarters and a bandana, I mean, those kind of experiences shifted my, my view of the world forever, and then what I did for the rest of my life. But I wondered for you all what that experience was, too, of interacting with white students or white people in a different manner than perhaps in a patronizing manner that white people were usually in. I stated earlier that Bruce Clunder was a, a dear friend, and uh, he was one of many uh, who had volunteered. In my interview with Robert Penn Warren, I talked about the white committed, uh, the people who paid the price to be involved, they didn't have to be, didn't ask to be in leadership roles necessarily, but but were there with their 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 bodies and their participation. And I have many friends who uh, I have been close to over the years who came out of the movement and they were white as well as black. So yeah, there's something about sharing an experience like that that people in the military say it's the same. Mm. That if you're in the foxholes, you never forget the people you were in the foxholes with. So, um that was 1965 when you did that? Yes. So uh, 1964, we had the Freedom Summer in Mississippi. And um, of course, um, Charles Sherrod in Southwest Georgia had uh, brought white students down um, as early as 1961, right, um, in Southwest Georgia. And the issue had kept Percolating within SNCC about the role of white people. Uh, Bob Zellner, who's in North Carolina as we speak, uh, working with the moral majority movement there, um, grew up in Alabama. He was white. And Colin Ann Braden from the Southern Conference Educational Fund uh, put money into SNCC so that SNCC could have its first white field secretary. And so that was in 1961. And Zellner came over, he was the only white person in the walkout from Berglund High School um, in the fall of 1961 uh, in the first demonstration by young Mississippi uh, uh, teenagers and school uh, kids um, in Mississippi. So um, after Freedom Summer, um, SNCC was not willing to do another program. In other words, uh, Freedom Summer set SNCC onto its course, which eventually ended up in the Black Power uh, movement. Um, but uh, Martin wanted 
um, to do it. And, um, and I remember he, he, they asked me if I would come speak um, to when they had the orientation for that program. Um, but the, your, your question about um, the way, the problem in this country, of course, is that the country has never quite been able to establish a we in the sense of we the people, right? Um, it has stumbled over who we is, right? And so to this day, we don't have um, a, a kind of uh, sense of we that brings us all together, right? Um, but that's what happened in the movement, right, for a brief period of time. Now, part of what is very scary, again, about the rhetoric with the current presidential election is that we're moving further and further away from the we that we need to be because there's too much that's part of the rhetoric that is causing uh, people to have to uh, move into different camps and that, uh, that, are, that, are, that are segregating, that are discriminatory, that are you know, uh, inflammatory and other kinds of things. And it, it is scary that the next president of the United States may be someone who pushes us even further, pushes us back even perhaps beyond where we were in the 1960s. And that is, that is very frightening. So um, this is my last comment. So we're a country that lurches. We lurch forward and we lurch back. And from my way of looking at us, um, we have lurched forward and back, roughly speaking, in units of time which span three quarters of a century. So our first unit of time was 1787 down to the Civil Wars. Right? Um, and we lurched forward and then we lurched back. Um, if you Google, if, um, I just sat here and Google Circular 3591. If you just Google Circular 3591, um, what comes up is Attorney General Francis Biddle, um, who is President Roosevelt's Attorney General, on December 12, 1941, issuing a circular to every state Attorney General telling them that they should now prosecute peonage as involuntary servitude or slavery. And this is bringing to an end, right, almost, well, you've got to say from after Reconstruction, right, uh, right down to World War II, right, it's close to 50, 60, 70 years, where young black men are rounded up routinely Right? They're the undocumented people of that area. They, have not, they don't have a piece of paper that says, I have a job, I have a source of income. So they are rounded up routinely, right? And then they are, when they are arrested, they don't have the money to pay the cost of court, right? And then they are sent into the mines, right? That's how we industrialize our country. Right? I mean, Douglas Blackman has written this in slavery by another name, right? So, um, so here you have a whole people. It's not until where, why, is, why does President Roosevelt tell his attorney general to do this? Because Japan has bombed us in Pearl Harbor five days earlier. And he now understands he needs young black men, right? And so we've got to stop the process of, of enslaving young black men, right, uh, through this business of you don't have any documentation. Undocumentation, you know, uh, I want to stop. So, so, but we're lurching, that's my point, right? Um, so we lurched, right, we lurched back, and then we lurched forward with the Civil Rights Movement, and, and we're gonna lurch it's not clear which way, right? Country's not gonna stay still, right? 
Can I just say one more thing, because we're leaving on a yes. little bit of a somber note. Yeah. <laughs> you know, change is uh, everybody's responsibility. Uh, let the world be changed and let it begin with me. So there's nothing inevitable about our country lurching into the dark ages, okay, by the choice we make as president. I'm not pitching anybody in particular, but I'm pitching the point that we do not have to tolerate anyone taking us back to uh, post-reconstruction days. We all have a responsibility, and we ought to exercise it. Not only vote ourselves, but get everybody in the world to do the same.